the number of decisions that the company makes is almost like a constant. It, it, it is a fixed external thing that uh, this company is going to make decisions, whether you like it or not. And I think as a, as a decision support team, you have to think about how do we improve the quality of decisions overall, all of them, not just a few that we are actively involved in, but all of them. Hello and welcome to Experimentation Masters, the leading resource for business experimentation. Join fellow innovators, strategists and entrepreneurs to learn practical tips, methods and techniques from world-leading experts in experimentation. Design better experiments, lead with more confidence and have greater impact in your organization. Now please welcome your host, Gavin Bryant. Hello and welcome to the Experimentation Masters podcast. Today, I would like to welcome Lucas Vermeer to the show. Lucas is currently the Director of Experimentation at Vista. He is widely acknowledged as a global leader in the field of online experimentation. Many of you will be familiar with Lucas's work as Director of Experimentation at Booking.com, where he improved customer experience through hundreds of thousands of experiments. Lucas has co-authored many influential academic papers on experimentation, also working as a freelance consultant to help businesses grow their experimentation culture. Welcome to the show, Lucas. Hey, happy to be here. I feel that uh, has massively understood your career and achievements, but uh, <laughs> you're pretty humble. So let's just keep it high level. Right? Actually, I think you're overstating it. I didn't uh, write many academic papers, just a bunch. <laughs> as, as second or third or fourth author. So don't overstate it. Like Now, uh, let's, uh, let's make a start with some, uh, some introductory questions. Uh, one of the things that I was interested in exploring further was uh, going back uh, a little bit to your childhood and understanding what it was like to grow up with academics as parents. <laughs> That's a fun question. Uh, so yeah, so, so both of my parents were, uh, were linguists. They were interested in, in language. My mother was focused on uh, uh, language acquisition by children. So how do, how do you teach kids Dutch? Uh, I was born and uh, raised in the Netherlands. So how do you teach kids Dutch in, uh, in primary school? And my father was focused mostly on second language acquisition. So, so immigrants wanting to learn uh, Dutch as a second language, when they, mostly when they were adults, which is an entirely different field, obviously. Um, what was it like? I, I don't, actually don't think I got a lot of the academic background of what my parents were doing. Like I, I, we did, it wasn't like we talked about statistical models at the dinner table. Um, <laughs> I think what I what I did get from it was that my parents had a lot of freedom in terms of uh, working from home uh, at the time already. So, so uh, both my parents were, I think, I, I mean, I was young, so I don't really recall, but I think both of them were working four days and at least one of them from home. Uh, so there was almost always a parent in the house. Uh, but at the same time, they were both working parents. So it wasn't like I had a stay at home mom or a stay at home dad. I had two working parents that were that were home uh, a lot. So I, th I think that's what what academic freedom gives you that you can work late, like you, you can work late in the evening, but you can re you can be home for your kids. Um, but I'm, not, I, I'm not sure I got a lot from it, although now you, now you mention it like um, my first start in computer science was actually through my dad because he he was working at the Unif University of Tilburg uh, and one of his colleagues was working on uh, language processing on computers. Uh, and I think I was eight or nine years old when he brought home a, a syllabus that explained uh, how to program in Turbo Pascal. And that was my first introduction to programming was a, was a, like a, an academic syllabus that was intended for first year students. Uh, it was my first, my first intro. Uh, and I think the first computer program I ever wrote was, um, uh, actually constructing that I, I was eight, right? So, so humor is different. Uh, I think it was constructing curse words, uh, by taking, ran like uh, taking random strings from uh, a set of uh, strings and then uh, concatenating them. So it would be like a first take uh, an adverb like dirty or ugly or nasty and then concatenate a noun such as pig or uh, 
bumpkin and then <laughs> press the button and it would generate a new curse word and that was that was fascinating to me that you could use like the, you could make the computer create things that you didn't predict in the sense that uh, there's a uh, uh, there's almost like an emergent property coming out of that out of the software uh, which i found found fascinating that, and that i think that later inspired me to to study to study uh computational science and then artificial intelligence and then experimentation flowed from that mm, yeah that's one of the things that i was wondering that uh back in the day those fields that you've now pursued um mm. you know, machine learning experimentation data science were very much emergent uh at the time so yeah, i was wondering we're emergent if, again yes it's still emerging we've had the the ai winter several times now right so, so uh, machine learning was very popular in the 70s, 60s 70s uh but then it sort of died out when people realized it was actually very difficult to do. Specifically, language was very difficult to do, which is how I ended up in that in that field. Uh, and now we're seeing a resurgence. And so now machine learning is once again popular because there's new technologies coming out that make new things possible that weren't possible before. And everyone's up in arms again, screaming how amazing AI is. And like we've been we've been here before. Like it's going to die out again. Uh, we're going to see the the limits of this technology again be uh, disappointed again uh, and then it's going to be quiet for a few years i suspect and then there will be another reemergence because because ai has been having these waves where people say oh i, I think the first like a uh, first uh, winter came after some professor said let's let's take us let's take a summer to figure out how to do language generation uh, with the computer uh, it should be easy right uh, and then it, it took like 50 years for them to get that, uh, to get to where we are now. Uh, mm, interesting. So thinking about uh, some of those things that uh, you're assess obsessing about right now, what, what are some of those things that uh, are consuming you at the moment? Uh, so many things, like my brain is so many different threads. So, so my current role at, at Vista, um, I have a very simple task, really. And this is a company that um, runs experiments already, but wants to run more. Uh, and so I, I, this is one of the academic papers that I've contributed to in the past, actually, which is the, the experimentation flywheel, which was spearheaded by Alexander Fabian. Um, and, and in that paper, we sort of described this idea that if you want to scale experimentation culture, really the only thing you need to do is identify where the friction is and then remove it. And that is pretty much it. Um, and so that's what I'm trying to do. I'm, I'm, I've tried to find a company where there is a will to experiment, but the, but they don't really know how to scale out. Uh, and so my day to day and the things I obsess up about is pretty much figuring out what is currently stopping Vista from running twice as many experiments as they are now. Like what what is the bottleneck right now? Uh, and then sort of pulling that thread and seeing whether whether we can remove it or whether we can uh, circumvent it or we can do something to, to sort of uh, grease the wheel a little bit. Uh, so that's, that's what I'm obsessing about, trying to figure out, like, what is that thing? that is Because, I mean, there's always, like, a thousand things I could be doing, all right? And, and I think, I don't know if you've read The, the Goal by Goldratt, uh, which is about process optimization, but, the, but the, one of the key insights in that book is that if you have a bottleneck in a process and you optimize just before the bottleneck, um, you make things worse, not better. And that's because the, because the work will just pile up just in front of the bottleneck. And this only makes the bottleneck more of a bottleneck. And so if you want to optimize a process, then you, you need to deliberately not invest in optimizing before the bottleneck, but you need to invest that same time in figuring out what the bottleneck is and then removing it. Because that is the way that you optimize a, a process. And so that's what, I'm, that's what I'm obsessing about right now. I read a good one uh, uh, recently. It was uh, the the founding and scaling of, of Vans footwear, hmm. the the streetwear label, and yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. yet the founder he he very much started in uh, quality control, process optimization, continuous improvement, which uh, hmm. which was an, an interesting sort of first fifty percent of the book. It yeah. did, it did feel very much like uh, the goal. Yeah. I mean, the goal, uh, have you read the Phoenix Project? No, I haven't read that one. Is it, uh, no, I'm checking. Yeah, the Phoenix Project. Uh, so so um, uh, a bunch of people rewrote the, the goal, essentially, 
but for IT, uh, including Gene Kim, who's very much into the DevOps movement. And so it's essentially the same idea as the goal, except apply to IT processes. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it's, it's, it's fascinating. I mean, I, I obviously, with my experimentation lens, I see a lot of opportunities for experimentation in that story, right? It's never mentioned directly, uh, but, uh, but I see a lot of, uh, a lot of angles there. And, it, and, and to me, it's interesting that, that when you think about how you scale out experimentation in, in an organization, it's partially uh, sort of operational efficiency and removing bottlenecks, because a, a, a lot of this is about how do I, as quickly as possible, push ideas out the door, right? And that, that is very much process optimization. But the other side of it is very much how do you get people to even uh, understand and appreciate that this is something that they should be doing, which is a lot about change management. And so, so this, this flywheel of experimentation is actually, it's not one uh, thing. It, it's actually two components. One is the operational efficiency and the other is sort of getting people on board and sort of bringing them along and uh, sort of helping them understand why they're doing what they're doing. And both have to, ha they both have to happen at the same time, right? They have to go hand in hand because if, if the operational efficiency isn't there, then it's going to be a lot more difficult to convince people to, to, to move along. Mm -hmm. uh, I think if you, uh, one of the, one of the books that, uh, really sort of crystallized these ideas for me was uh, was switch uh, how to change things when change is hard uh, what, the, what are those brothers called again uh, Heath, yeah, Heath. The brothers. <laughs> sorry <coughs> <coughs> you can cut that out so um, uh, one, one of the books that really crystallized those ideas for me was uh, was switch how to change things when change is hard by the, by the brothers Heath and them um, they talk about things like highlighting bright spots, right? So, so rather than focusing on the places where it's not working, which is what operational efficiency is all about, right? Fig figure out what the bottleneck is. When you want to change sort of organizational mindset, you actually need to focus on the things that are working and highlight them and show them to people and say like, hey, this team is running experiments and they're having a lot of success doing it and here's how they did it. Uh, and so you sort of have to have this, this split brain almost where on the operational side, you're trying to identify bottlenecks and then on the organizational side, you're trying to identify uh, bright spots. Yeah, I have had that book previously recommended by another podcast guest, Ruben DeBoer. Oh, really? Mm. It's good. It's a good yeah. book. How about uh, thinking outside of work directly? What else are you obsessing about? Oh, boy. Well, I have three young kids. So, so my life outside of work is mostly kids. Uh, what am I obsessing about? How do I make those into good human beings? That's a, that's a momentous task. That's worthwhile. Um, it's difficult though because I've never done it before. Uh, it's not like a lot. It's not a lot of good literature on this topic, to be honest. It's surprising, like given how long people have been raising kids, it's difficult to find good stuff on how to raise kids. There's no playbook, is there? There's no playbook. No, there's no playbook. This is mostly about mindset, not uh, your own uh, attitude. I think. Mm -hmm. and the other thing I, I've, I mean, I, I mean, I've been obsessing about plants in my office for a, for a long time. But now I, I, you can see behind me, you've got the video on, but um, we've been branching into aquariums because I, I realized I had all of these different plants, like plants on the floor, plants in the ceiling, plants on the walls. And it's like, you know, you know where else plants live? They live underwater. Uh, so I, I decided I was going to do uh, an aquarium. So, so I've been obsessing about sort of optimizing the aquarium. I have a, a bigger one downstairs. Now my wife is saying she wants a saltwater aquarium. That's just another level. Like, <laughs> like we've got a sweet, a sweet water now, which is which is fun with a bunch of shrimp. So yeah, I I try to find like things to sort of tinker and um, toy with. Uh, that I, I'm not someone who will completely obsess about one thing for ten years. Like I I get bored very easily. And, and so I obsess about something for at most a year. And then it's like, yeah, done. Next, move on. And so I was very much into home ele like uh, electrical wiring of my house last year. Like I rewired a bunch of rooms just because I wanted to know how to do it. Like I'd never done it before. Uh, then by the time I knew how to do it, I'm like, okay, now I know how to do it. Next. So it's more that once you feel that you've exhausted the learning opportunity from the immersion in that area, you move on to the next opportunity. Oh man, have you seen my GitHub? 
like that's just a this is a graveyard of half finished projects where mm-hmm. the the project ends as soon as I know how to finish it like that not when it's finished but when I know when I can see the end that's when I give up I do not give up but sort of move on and say okay so now I've exhausted everything I can learn from this I know how it ends now uh, move on so with books you you read to learn rather than read to finish Oh, no. Oh, that's okay. So this is weird. Um, No, that's exactly the opposite. So with books, my OCD kicks in and I absolutely have to finish it, even if I absolutely hate it. Really? Uh, Yes. Yes. Uh, I will plow through and read a book that I absolutely hate so that just so that at the end of it, with full conviction, I can rate it one star on Goodreads and say, I absolutely fucking hate that. Because <laughs> <laughs> if I don't finish it, I feel I don't feel qualified to sort of give it a, a rating because I maybe like maybe it gets better. Right. So so I yeah, no, with books I definitely, definitely have to finish it. It's also um books have a more rounded finish feels like a lot of these projects that i have on github they're like never ending projects they, they can always you can always iterate and improve and, and go on and do more whereas with a book like once you finish the book it's over right there's there is no iteration to of this book well, some books yes but if you're that's why i never start series because uh, uh, like i did make the mistake once of um starting in the name of the wind i believe the book is called where it's a three-part series where the third book at the time when I was reading it wasn't written yet. And so I read the first book, loved it, read the second book, loved it, and then wanted to read the third book and it didn't exist yet. That was the most frustrating experience ever. Mm. Like, I want to read this now. <laughs> <laughs> Instant gratification. <laughs> hey, let's uh, switch focus a bit and uh, talk a moment about booking.com. One of the things that I'm sure the audience will be really interested to to learn about and understand is is what it feels like to work day in day out in a in a market leading world leading experimentation program. So on the ground, when you're operating at peak, what sorts of things are you seeing, and what does it feel like? Oh boy, does a fish know it's wet? Uh-huh. I mean. Like when you when you're in in the middle of that, I don't think you I don't think I realized all that much. And, and maybe it looks like that from the outside because we wrote about it, right? We we wrote as if we fully appreciated and understood what we were doing, but really we were just living the day to day. I don't I, I'm like it's just a job, man. Like it's just an office you go to and people you work with. And then I think in hindsight. I, those were some of the most brilliant people I ever worked with. They, I mean, they, that, that's a, it still is an amazing team. Like I, I, I'm nostalgic about those, uh, those times. Um, but I don't think it was a very deliberate conscious thing where like day in, day out, we were, we were thinking like, yeah, we're operating at peak. No, we're just doing our thing. Like there's always shit broken. Like you're, you're, there's always stuff to fix. I do, one of the things I found interesting actually is that People from the outside would look at booking and say, oh, you're, you're operating at peak efficiency. You're, you're doing so well in experimentation program. Whereas the conversations I was having with my own team about what we were doing as, a, as an experimentation support group, a lot of the conversations were very negative in the sense that we were talking about all the problems that we were seeing and all the ways that we could still improve. Like there was a, there was a strong drive within that group to actually make booking even better at experimentation because we saw all the risks. The thing is, if you're running 10 experiments on the side uh, in your marketing department and you're, you're making mistakes, that's not so bad because it's really not that much of a threat to the business. But, it, but at booking, when you're at that scale and li- pretty much every single product decision is supported by experimentation, if you're not running those experiments to sort of the utmost quality standards, then that is a real threat to the business. I mean, I, I would argue it's less of a threat than sort of not running experiments and, and guessing, but it does put, put a lot of responsibility on the people responsible for the infrastructure and the people supporting the decision-making process because they understand now that all of the decisions in the business are going to be in some way supported by what they are doing. That's a lot of pressure to put on a, on a central a central team. Not not because they're making the decisions, but because they know if we make a mistake in the data collection process, two thousand people next week are going to make the wrong decision. 
right? That's a lot. That's a lot of pressure. Mm -hmm. So I think we we didn't really think about it in terms of operating at peak. We we really felt sort of the the pressure to perform and to sort of give these thousands of people running experiments the best possible data and the best possible support. Mm -hmm. It's a rush, I can tell you. <laughs> Do you feel that um, with that level of maturity, that then the focus can can shift somewhat um, to really being really sharp with uh, decision evaluation and decision making? Well, this is this is one of the things that I came to realize that, and, and this, I find this fascinating when I talk talk to. Uh, other people in the field is that there's no such thing as a perfect experiment. It does not exist, right? There's only, uh, it's a, it's a continuum between very well executed, detailed, uh, experiments and sort of winging it off the seat of your pants without an experiment. And between that, there's a large scala of different uh, options. And I, I, I've always thought about this as a rising tide floats all boats. So the, the intent is not deliberately not, to make very few super high quality decisions and then wing the rest. Because that is what, that is, what is going to happen, right? The, 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 the number of decisions that the company makes is almost like a constant. Mm -hmm. it, it, it is a fixed external thing that uh, this company is going to make decisions whether you like it or not. And I think as a, as a decision support team, you have to think about how do we improve the quality of decisions overall, all of them. Not just a few that we are actively involved in, but all of them. And I think you do that by by looking at the the broad scale of decisions that are being made and saying, how do I make all of them just a tiny bit better? Not take a few and make them perfect. It's, again, that's impossible. But make all of them just a tiny bit better. I think this is one of the the key mental models that I took away from from booking. Also, is that you you look at sort of all of the experiments that people are running. You try to identify what are the threats to validity that, uh, that are, are being made or that, that are happening here. And then you try to address those at scale. So not by uh, intervening and sort of going to a single experimenter and saying, hey, you forgot to do a power analysis. Can you please do a power analysis? Right? But thinking about why did this person not do a power analysis? What would enable them to do a power analysis next time without my, uh, my direct involvement? So thinking about this as a... Uh, and th that the decisions will be made, whether you like it or not. But how do we improve them uh, at scale for the for the next one? I think that's uh, the key. So thinking about some of those other mental models you formed at Booking, what what would some of those top mental models be? Oh. Does anyone deliberately, like, I don't know where you got this question, but does anyone deliberately form mental models? And then if, when they do, are, are they like aware of them? Because I'm not, like I, I learned a lot of stuff over the years and I, I would say 80 to 90% of it isn't conscious. Like these are just things that seem normal to me or that, that I consider to be uh, common sense. But when you explain it to someone, they go, oh, that's interesting. And I, I didn't even realize that was something that you could consider, right? This happens, happens to me all the time when I do consulting, when we're talking about something and I explain how I view something. And then people go, like, if people respond as if it's some deep insight or epiphany where I, I, that, that's not what it was at all. Like this is, these are just habits that I picked up along the way. It's not a, it's not a conscious or deliberate thing. I guess, I guess that's what we mean by uh, lived experience. But I mean, mental models. So, so one of the mental models is what I just described, that, that decisions will be made and the, and the job isn't to make a few perfect ones, but the job is to make most of them better. I think that is a, that is a key one. The other one that I, that I picked up, thanks to a man named Chad, uh, who, who was one of the developers on the team, uh, brilliant guy, um, there's a lot of, there were a lot of good human beings on that team. Like they're not just good developers, good, good data scientists, but just good humans. Uh, and he was one of them. He is one of them. Um, and the, the model is that, um, you, you can't really force people to think or understand. 
And, and what we want with experimentation is we want people to understand what they're doing and think about what they're doing so that they can learn about the customer experience. That, that's what we want to achieve. And we cannot really force them to. Like, you can't say, you must write the hypothesis. Well, you can, but what they're going to do is basically mash their hands on the keyboard and, and sort of input random strings into a field because you made them, right? And so this idea that you can make, uh, for example, that you can make a power calculation mandatory I, I think is a fallacy. Like, I, I don't think you can make those things mandatory. You can make filling out a field mandatory that doesn't make thinking mandatory, right? People just put random gibberish in. Uh, and the model that Chad came up with is actually uh, is an eight-step model where before you even contemplate making something enforced, there are seven other things that you need to do. And I, I can't ramble them off the top of my head, but they're basically things like it has to be possible first. Right. If if currently it's not possible for people to enter a power calculation result in the in the tool, then how are you going to expect them to? How are you forcing them to? Right. First, you have to make it possible. Then you have to make it easy. Then you have to make it desirable. Then you have to make it to the fault. Then you have to have to make it encouraged. And so basically, you can sort of escalate the amount of pressure or the amount of nudging uh, that you're using to encourage people to to comply or to to follow these procedures. Uh, and so I think a nice example is that a lot of these experimentation platforms that uh, are, are on the market, um, they will ask users to pick their primary metric. Uh, and then when you, when you do, uh, that is the first metric that they show on the report. So when you run the experiment, the first thing that you sh they show you is that primary metric. Now, that is a way to make it very easy for people to, to indicate what is their uh, primary decision metric. Right. Not all platforms do this. Some platforms just give you 500 metrics and then allow you to fish after the fact. Now, a statistician will tell you that that's a bad idea. You shouldn't be able to pick like your metric post hoc. You should be able to you should be uh, picking it up front. But rather than saying um, it is mandatory to input this information, right, these platforms are giving you value in return. You pick the primary metric and that's the thing that they show you first which for you as a user is, is one, it, it, it's easy from a UX perspective, but also it gives you immediate motivation and incentive to actually co comply with this part of the process. That, that idea you can extend out, right? So if you think about the booking platform or you think about AB Smartly that I'm working with at the moment, um, they don't just ask for the primary metric, they also ask for the expected direction. So is it, should this number go up or down? And by how much do you expect that it should at least go up or down? Now. Those last two are essentially the minimum detectable effect. Now, the statisticians have been trying for years to elicit MDEs from people, right? By asking them, can you please do a power analysis? Or by saying it is mandatory to do a power analysis. But I think the, the answer is that you should actually make it easy for people, not say it's mandatory to do it, but to say, what is the easiest way that I can elicit this information from a user? What is the most value and immediate value I can give back to them? by displaying this information as part of the report, for example. And so the, 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 the booking tool, when you enter this information, the report will actually change to adjust so that you don't have to remember what the direction was that you were expecting. It will actually highlight this. And then you don't have to remember what size effect you were expecting. It will show you. And you don't have to do the power analysis yourself. It will do it for you because it has all the information now that it needs to do these things. And so the, 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 the user is incentivized to follow protocol correctly because the tool is giving them value back. I think this, this mental model of um, experimentation as a strict protocol uh, can, can be uh, accomplished not by enforcing the protocol, but by giving users value back when they stick to the protocol and by encouraging those defaults. I think that is a, that is a, a key mental model. And it relates to what I was saying earlier, where you want to support as many decisions as possible. You want to sort of rise and kite float to both, right? So you want, you want to elevate all of them. And the easiest way, I think, to do that is not to act like the police and enforce it at scale, because that doesn't work. But the easiest way is to give immediate value back so that when people make similar decisions, they they come to you and say, actually, for this decision, I also want that value that you're giving me. And so it suddenly it becomes a, a, a poor a, a, a push, not pull, right? The, the, suddenly people come to you and say, well, actually, uh, this value that you're giving us, we, we would also like to see it here. Mm, right, you touched on compliance. So rather than mm -hmm. being compliance and a carrot and stick approach, it's really helping people to become more effective in the role, which 
ultimately they want to to do. They want to be more successful. Yeah, I guess I guess the, and you asked about mental models. I think another mental model I picked up is that um, building or the sort of building for internal users or building an experimentation platform isn't all that different from regular product management or product development, right? We, we, we think about uh, these websites that we're building where users come to the website and we want them to convert. We want them to buy our stuff and to, and to encourage them to buy our stuff. We explain to them why our stuff is the best. And then we make it e really easy for them to flow through a funnel and they ultimately give us their money, right? That, that is basically what product management is trying to do, sort of solve user problems on the, on the way to giving you money. Um, Experimentation internally in, the, in a company isn't very different, right? We want people to make better decisions. Uh, we have a lot of users in our, in, in our systems. Uh, we want them to make those decisions using our tools. We have to think about how do we encourage them to come, come to our platform? How do we make the platform as easy as possible so that they go through the flow and, and, and ultimately make decisions using the platform? This, this isn't a whole lot different from regular product management. There's, you could even define like a, a funnel for experimentation and say, well, these are all the decisions that are out there, which is equivalent to sort of the market, the entire market, and saying how much market share we have, like for how many decisions do people come to us? And then of that market share, is our, if the market share is small, then maybe we should do some marketing internally, right? And get, get more people to come to our platform. Mm -hmm. And of the people that do come to our platform, how many ultimately do set up an experiment, right? So how many, how many convert down the funnel? Uh, so, so you can model it in exactly the same way. Um, and that means you can use all the same uh, books and techniques. Uh, so, so one of the books I've been using, don't tell anyone, just uh, uh, this, is, this isn't being recorded, right? Um, uh, the Influence, Ciodini, um, is, is geared towards sales, right? It's geared towards marketing. Uh, but actually, when you read Switch about change management and you read Ciodini, like all of these ideas are the same. Like, uh, like reciprocity doesn't just work when you're selling things to customer. It also works when you're selling things to internal stakeholders, mm -hmm. right? You can apply exactly the same things. Highlighting the bright spots in Switch is essentially just social proof, right? You find places where things are working and then you go, look at this team over here. They're doing great, right? The Vista hiring me is essentially authority, right? It's basically they hire the guys that we now have the guy who does experiments, right? Now we're going to do experiments. That's just proof by authority. So, so these techniques that we, we think about in the context of experimentation uh, as being the, the content of the experiment, so the things that we're trying out on our website in order to convince users to buy our product, those exact same techniques you can apply to experimentation in general in your own company and say, well, actually, I want to nudge people to make better decisions. What, what tools do I have at my disposal to nudge them in that direction? Mm. And I guess uh, overall, it get, gets back to that, uh, that little loop. I, I think it was highlighted in Alexander's article about the flywheel investment, value investment. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, it, it, it feeds the whole flywheel and the experimentation program at large. Yep. Let's uh, shift the discussion uh, to Vista now. So thinking about those early days at Vista, what was your initial assessment of experimentation at Vista? Experimentation oh, guy. Yeah, that's a good question. So this is a good question because um, I came in thinking that there was going to be almost nothing. And I was actually pleasantly surprised in the sense that there's actually a lot of testing already going on. Um, one of the things I found fascinating is that they've actually been testing for a long, very long time as well. So, so they started running experiments pretty much at the same time as Booking did. Um, the thing they didn't do was centralize. So there's a lot of pockets of the organization where experiments are being run at a pretty decent scale, like not, uh, not thousands, but I would say the, the ones that we're tracking are like 50 uh, ish, but I think there's there's more pockets that we haven't touched yet where there's more experiments being run. So I would say they're on the order of hundreds, um, and that was that was interesting to me in the sense that where I, where I came from. So Booking has had pretty much since the beginning a centralized place where all experiments were stored, were retrievable, uh, discussions were happening, people would look. 
Uh, so there was a very, even though decisions were decentralized, and I mean, we, we talked about this in uh, democratizing online experimentation, right? We talked about decentralization of decision making. But ironically, that is made possible by the centralization of infrastructure and documentation, right? People trust that this other team over there is, uh, is doing the right thing because they can expect, inspect all of the decisions and all of the data that's supporting that decision. And so the, the centralization of tooling makes the decentralization of decision making so much easier. And one of the things I find interesting about Vista is that they, they do not have this centralization or did not when I, when I joined. One of the first things we started building is, is, is figuring out like how do we take these different tribes and help them speak the same language, help them put documentation in the same place so they, so they can learn from each other. Because I think that is, the, that is the critical mass that you need. If you, if you really want to scale, then people need to learn from each other. And they can only do that if the entire thing is transparent. And transparent isn't, uh, uh, you can always ask me about my experiments. Right? That is not transparency. Transparency is not, oh, I put all of my stuff over here in, a, in an accessible folder. That's also not transparent. Transparency actually requires standards because you need to have the same way of writing down things so that I can understand what it is that you did. Because if you use different words to describe the same metrics, then even if I can read all of your stuff, I still won't understand it and I still won't have transparency. So you do need some amount of uh, centralization and standardization limited amount of how knowledge is documented in order for, for sort of the um, learning to happen at scale. One of, the, one of the books that was really influential there, uh, which inspired my thinking, but I would not recommend anyone read, <laughs> it, um, is uh, Communities of Practice, uh, which is a very academic piece of work. Uh, but it's a, uh, it, it describes several groups of people who are who learn from each other a practical skill. So the classic example is tailors, street tailors, uh, or butchers, uh, who uh, that there's a lot of practical uh, details to that skill. Right? It's not like you read a book about tailoring and then suddenly you know how to be a tailor on the street. Like you you learn this from what, from observing other people. And so this book talked a lot about how how do these people learn? And and so one of the things I found interesting is that uh, the that you you learn to uh, uh, do these things almost backwards in the sense that the 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 from you don't start with like a fancy suit, you start with underwear because it's easier, right? And you don't start with the cutting of the fabric, you start with putting buttons on existing or almost finished garments, right? So it's really inside out, back to front. And so a master tailor will uh, cut all the, all the cloth for you, sew it together, and then say, please put the buttons on. And once you know how to do that, then they cut all the fabric, give it to you and say, please sew it together, right? And then as you, as you mature, as you get better, at some point you'll be cutting your own fabric. And then you work from inside out, so you start instead of making underwear, you start making shirts and sort of expand that. that, that um, there is a lot of parallels between the, these community of practice that are being described in that book and what I saw happening uh, at Booking in the sense that um, when Booking grew really fast, uh, we brought people in who didn't really have practical experience running experiments. And then within weeks, they were running their own A-B tests. And like I mentioned before, like we were, a fish doesn't know it's wet. Like I didn't think about how that was even possible, right? We, we had a one day training where we taught people the sort of the basic skills. And we always said, this is a language course. This is where you learn the words to talk to your peers. But I didn't fully appreciate how important it was that we then gave those people the language and then put them in a community of other people who knew how to run tests. I think that was the key that we took a developer off the street, taught him the words like significance, confidence, uh, power, right? Teach, teach them the, base, the basics, and then put them in a team with five other developers who all have been running experiments for months or years. And that is where they really learn how to run an experiment. They didn't learn it from me. They learned it from their peers. I think the, 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 the experimentation landscape at Vista, to bring it back to the question, is because it's not centralized because it's so fragmented. This is really hard because we bring in someone, we teach them the basics, 
where do we put them? We we'll put them in in a tribe that is closed. And I'm, tr- I'm trying to break open those silos, trying to sort of get those people to talk to each other, because I because I believe that if and, and I mean, I say believe, right? I, I have no data to back this up, but I believe that if we get these people to talk to each other, then they can teach each other. And that is a much more scalable approach to improving the overall decision level uh, rather than having a centralized authority being being the only one. So I I think that the central team should be teaching those few people at the peak. And this is also the the, the model that the uh, LAVA uses in the in communities practice. There there is a uh, there's a very select group of people who are the absolute experts on a particular topic. Then there is a first ring of people around that that are very dedicated topics, spend a lot of time in it, try to really understand it, and they get most of their knowledge from those experts. They get they, they really talk to the to the uh, to the expert team, and then there's a super wide periphery of people who are just tangentially involved, like who are watching from the side and who are learning by observing others doing. And so a lot of the learning isn't actually happening between the experts and the first tier. A lot of the learning is happening between the first tier and the wide periphery. And so you have to create an environment where the wide periphery can actually see what is going on. And I think this is one of the things that we're, we're trying to engineer is to, to figure out how do we um, create a connection between the expert, so my team, expert team, and first tier. So first we have to create the first tier. How do we create a connection between experts in first tier? How do we connect connection between first tier and uh, periphery? How do we make that process transparent so that other people can see what is going on and learn from it? Um, and we, we wrote about this uh, on the blog also when we wrote about the ambassador program. The ambassador program is essentially that first, creating that first, bootstrapping that first tier, right? Mm-hmm. Ide- ideally, this occurs naturally, it, it organically it comes into being. But we sort of have to bootstrap it that's a good segue into my next question around how you're organizing for scaled experimentation you mentioned uh, one of those pillars is in ambassador program what are some of the other pillars for the program Uh, so it's essentially a hybrid model right there's a lot of i mean a lot of stuff out there already about the different models that you you can you can try and i think um we are very much uh, going for a, a, a center of excellence model where there is a, a central group of people. One of the, the tweaks we're making to that is that we're saying the center of excellence isn't just experts on experimentation. It also has to be a product team. And so we have a product manager and four developers um, because uh, I mentioned before, you want to remove friction from the process. You want to sort of create operational efficiency. And to do that, you, you have to build stuff that people can use. And so uh, just analysts is, isn't sufficient, right? So the center of excellence has to be, I think, a combination of uh, analytical expertise and then uh, a product development uh, team. And then the ambassador program is, is that first tier I mentioned, that's the first line support. Uh, that's, a, that's a group that is deliberately heterogeneous in the sense that we wanted to create connections between the different silos in the organization and different parts of the business. So the ambassador program is deliberately taking from different parts of the organization and creating uh, human connections between them so that they know to find each other and they know where expertise lives. So it becomes sort of a a highway for information between the different uh, tribes uh, that are already there. Uh, It's also deliberately uh, heterogeneous in terms of background. So it's not just analysts. It's also uh, UX uh, and product managers and uh, hopefully developers soon because we want to you want that sort of uh, group to have as as diverse a skill portfolio uh, as possible. Uh, and because we wanted to make sure that this wasn't a, a side job, this was a, a, a sort of a, um, a a clear and supported mandate, uh, every ambassador also has a sponsor in their own part of the organization. So they don't report to me, they report to someone somewhere else in the organization. And I go out to the sponsor and say, hey, uh, I want you to dedicate at least one or two days of this person's time to being an ambassador. So that, it, so that on the one hand, that's a signal for me that they are bought into the program, that it isn't sort of perfunctory saying, oh, yes, we'll, we'll have an ambassador, but they don't actually have time for it. Right? I want uh, ambassadors from parts of the organization where there is buy-in. And this is a way for me to sort of validate that there is buy-in. On the other hand, it gives the ambassador a clear a mandate to 
to invest time in this. Like it's not just like you are you are expected to do this. This is literally your job now, and so you are being paid to do this. So it gives them incentive to actually commit to the program, and it gives them a piece of authority, right? So so to to their own part of the organization, they can say, yeah, I am the ambassador. This is my sponsor. Here's how I'm spending my time. Here's how you can see I'm part of the program. So we very deliberately made all of these tiny decisions in order to sort of create a, a cohesive group that had authority. Um, and then, uh, like I mentioned, you want the periphery to learn, right? So we, we want the rest of the organization to learn from these ambassadors. And so we said very much from the beginning, we said the ambassador is the long-term vision for this program is for it not to be required. Like the, if, we, if we are successful, this thing will go away. Because ideally, the, the, the ambassador program becomes an orga organic thing where every part of the organization has their own local resident know-it-all that is like the, the person that you go to when you have questions about experimentation. And, th and that shouldn't be sort of an official program. That is something that organically grows. And so the long-term vision for the ambassador program is for it to disappear. I mean, it takes time and effort to support it, right? Ideally, we, we spend that on other things. And that really set the tone, I think, also for the ambassadors for them to realize, oh, wait, actually, um, I'm learning all these skills now, and I have a title now. That That is not forever, and that is not the end goal. The end goal is for me to teach everyone around me so that I can go back to doing other things, right? And so it really set the tone also for the ambassadors to understand that their role isn't so much to sort of follow the curriculum and then sort of play this new part, but that really the the, the role for them is also to figure out how do I teach everyone around me uh, to do these same things. Mm. Yeah, about a year the, in, so so we'll see we'll see how successful we are, right? Because all of this is just an experiment. Uh, so we'll see how it goes. So um, thinking uh, around eighteen months on now into the Vista journey, what are some of those parts of the flywheel that you're working on to remove friction to get to spin faster? Oh. There's a lot. Like that, I mean, this is the fun part about thinking about uh, experimentation in this model, right? That uh, once you start thinking about it in terms of identifying points of friction and resolving them, and thinking about it as product development, you get to do things like prioritize uh, by uh, effort reward, like the same way we would do for a product uh, by saying like, how much value do we expect to get and how much effort do we have to put in? You can do the same thing for friction, right? You look at points of friction and say, hmm, solving this thing or making it easier for people to do this thing would take us like six months. And the number of experiments we can run additional would be like, I don't know, 10 a month. That is not worth it. Like that, that is not going to be something that we invest in. Um, and so what bottlenecks of friction was one of the things I found, um, surprising is that, um, the, the the vendor platforms that you buy off the shelf, they don't really seem to be built for scaled experimentation. They, they're more like, uh, they seem to be built for like, if you have one team that runs experiments, and then there's a dashboard that you look at that gives you the results. They don't really do the process part and like helping you document what was the hypothesis, what did the screenshots look like, what decision did we make, who made that decision, why did they make that decision? Like those are all things that are maybe not part of the reporting aspect of the metrics. So they're sort of put to the side. But I think from a, from a scalable experimentation point of view, they are super important because I need to be able to go into someone else's experiment and understand why they made a particular decision or even what decision they made, right? And so the bottlenecks and friction points that we're seeing are around um, how do we document these things in a central mm -hmm. place so that they're accessible? Um, another that I found interesting was uh, how do you do QA? So the ability to quickly turn things on and off to see whether the experiment actually does what you expect it to. Uh, how do you check whether metrics are flowing through correctly? So how do you know that the thing is actually tracking what you wanted to track? These are all things where there was a lot of friction in the process and people were doing a lot of manual work and sort of having a few developers say, oh, you know what? People are manually editing uh, cook the, the vendor documentation in this case literally said, open up the cookie in the developer toolbar and change the, the text in the cookie to something else and that copy pasting it from one tab to the other tab to, to sort of change the cookie value. And we're looking at going like the, like the amount of errors that people can make and the amount of tabs and the sort of mind capacity that they need to do this. And so one of the developers just created a, a simple web app where you click a button and it changes your cookie. 
Like that is the kind of friction removal that I'm talking about. That is like a developer spends maybe two days building that. And then like 50 people who are setting up tests can suddenly QA with a click of a button. Like that is, a, that is the kind of friction that we want to take out of the process that if, we, if we want to get really, really efficient at this. Good point. Now thinking about, uh, you know, experimentation, notionally experimentation is a business utility that can be used broadly across any business. So how are you expanding experimentation beyond A-B testing at Vista? Oh, that's fun. Uh, I mean, and this is one of the things that actually drew me to, uh, to Vista is that uh, uh, booking is a two sided marketplace, but it doesn't really control the supply. They, they, like the hotels decide what goes on the website. Vista actually does the production as well. So they have uh, factories around the world where the, the, the stuff that they sell gets made. Uh, and so there's opportunities there for optimization and experimentation as well. And so Places where we're expanding is we published about the um, uh, time split testing for pricing uh, testing. We didn't want to uh, run experiments where based on your cookie, we show you a different price. That didn't seem like the right thing to do. Uh, and so instead, we flipped the price by day. So every other day, uh, the price might change. And then we use that as a way. It's still essentially still an A-B test, except that uh, we're randomizing on days rather than on cookies or users. Um, and then there's experiments that we're running in the call center where the, a lot of customer support uh, is done through call center agents. Uh, we want to figure out like how do we make them happy? How do we make them efficient? How do we make sure that they help customers in a way that makes those customers come back? So that's an interesting uh, area that we're expanding in. And I, I mean, we haven't done this yet, but I would love to expand in onto the factory floor. I think so much of our business is is sort of relying on efficient processes in the in the factory, and I would love to run more experiments there. And that that's one of those areas where I I know they are already running experiments, you're just not documenting them in a central way. And so then I would actually be interested to see what can the people who are running experiments in the call center learn from the people who are running experiments on the factory and vice versa. Uh, so yeah, that's a, I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, it's um, yeah, it's an interesting uh, thought there. Like the, the spectrum is very broad. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity right through from front end through customer acquisition, right through into logistics and and supply chain. So it yeah. sounds like there's enormous possibility. Yeah, we did the same thing at Booking, though, right? So, so, so Booking has the call center software is integrated in the same experimentation platform, so they can run routing experiments. Uh, and you, you, so you think about things like um, if a Japanese customer calls customer service, but there is currently no one available who speaks, who is Japanese, um, but there is someone available who is uh, Italian, but happens to speak Japanese. Um, what would a Japanese customer prefer, speaking to an Italian who speaks Japanese or waiting for a few minutes until a Japanese person is available. Like you could, you could obviously ask them, right? As part of the flow, mm -hmm. uh, but you can also run an experiment to see which which one of these leads to more abandonment and leads to more uh, return customers and more loyalty. So that's the sort of thing that you can do in the call center. That I, I think, from a user experience point of view, these things are super impactful, right? I mean, we, we talk about experimentation, we often talk about button colors. I don't actually think button colors are all that important, apart from things like contrast. Uh, contrast is super important. Um, but I think when you think about the customer service, like that's a moment that the user really needs help and that you can really impact the customer experience. So ideally, I think you, you find those places where you can actually have the most impact on the customer experience. That's where you want to experiment. Uh, yeah, I mean, that could significantly increase retention and lifetime value. It, it's highly impactful. Yep. Okay, let's uh, close up with uh, fast forward questions now. So number mm -hmm. one, what's one topic that we haven't discussed that you'd like to discuss? That's a really difficult question. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Like, um... What is one we, we've talked mostly about organizational dy dynamics, organizational change. We did, we hardly talked about statistics, which is good because uh, it's really a sideshow, honestly. So much emphasis on, on statistics in the field where, um, yeah, I'm happy we didn't talk about that today. 
Um, well, we, had, we, had, we had sort of planned to. We're, we're going to dive into we SRM, but uh, oh, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. time well, is uh, at a premium. Well you, well, you should definitely check for SRM, just to be clear. Like, let, let, let's get, let me get on my high horse for like 30 seconds. Um, it, it is astounding to me that there are still experimentation platforms out there that do not check for SRM. It is super trivial. It's super easy to do. You can catch a whole boatload of issues this way. Uh, even the best experimentation companies and experimentation platforms in the world still suffer from this every once in a while. And so it's super important that you check for, for a sample ratio mismatch. Uh, One thing that I, I wanted to ask you quickly about that, do, do you feel that uh, you know some people are maybe trivializing it, that uh, in your, your taxonomy of root causes, there's you know approximately 30 causes there that have been identified and And very much the focus is largely around incorrect randomization that uh, should people be looking more broadly and deeply at um, causes of SRM? I think on the web, at least, uh, incorrect randomization isn't actually a likely cause because if, if there's problems with randomization, you would see it in almost every experiment. And that's actually the easier ones to, to fix. Um, the, the most likely cause that I've seen is actually missing data as a result of uh, telemetry being affected by the treatment. So if you change something about a web page, that can change how likely it is that the, the browser can report back that something was changed. Uh, and I actually, when we started writing that paper, I thought that was the only cause. I thought there was only one cause for our SRM, and that was missing data. Uh, and it's, it's only when we started writing the paper that we realized that there were other uh, potential causes. Yeah. Number I don't, two, I don't think you... people are trivializing it, by the way. And I, I, I yeah. hope not. I certainly hope not. No, I mean, the, 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 the odds that if you find an SRM, the odds that that is actually benevolent or that there's no problem are really slim. Like usually like your stuff's just broken. Mm. Number two, what's frustrating you the most with experimentation at the moment? Yeah. Frustrating the most with experimentation. Uh, so off the top of my head, I can think of two. One is this recurring theme of bandits are better than experiment than A/B testing, and people the people just completely confusing the two. Like they are different; they're solving for different use cases. They're doing different things. They, one does not replace the other. Please stop. Um, And the other is um, th there's a lot of emphasis on sort of new novel statistical techniques uh, that, for example, that allow for continuous testing, so uh, continuously valid p-values, or that uh, uh, that do some form of variance reduction, sort of reduce the variance on the, on the metric. And I'm, I'm not saying that those techniques aren't correct. Like the, I think both of them are, are interesting uh, techniques. I just think that they're being oversold or overvalued. I think a lot of companies still struggle to get the basics right. And, and um, the same with the multivariate testing, right? If, if uh, these companies are trying to run A, B, C, D, E, F, G experiments and then analyzing like a multifactorial experiment before they've ever run a proper A, B. And running a proper A, B is hard. Like it's not easy. Uh, and so I think it, people should make sure that they can walk and run before they try to fly mm. uh, so these like I, i understand from a marketing perspective it int is interesting to be able to say we have the newest fancy statistics but actually from a from an application point of view that is the least interesting thing i think i think mm. platforms should help users run experiments correctly uh, rather than emphasize the the newest shiniest statistics mm. Good point. is there anything else that you're learning about that we should know about That I'm learning about? Yeah. Oh boy. I'm, I, I had a great conversation with um, Positive John about this, John Ostrowski, that I'm not actually that deliberate about what I learned. 
the guy and and he was talking about like how how about serendipity and luck and how do you get to where you are and sort of and I, and I realized that I actually haven't been very deliberate about the things that I learn. I've been I've been chasing things that I find interesting or that that sort of tickle my curiosity. Um, and I've I've been thinking about it not in terms of learning, but more in terms of like what opportunities do I create for myself. So if I learn to do this thing, what new things become possible? That's actually a, a life lesson I, I learned very early on in my career, which was very much the opposite, where a sitting at a custom, I was a consultant, I was sitting at a customer together with a very senior uh, consultant. And he was doing most of the stakeholder management and sort of documentation writing. I was writing all of the code. Um, and I assumed that he was a management consultant, that he couldn't write a single line of code. Uh, until I think about six months into the project, something broke in production. And like within a minute, this guy loaded up the terminal, logged into my development environment, fixed my bug in production and logged off again. And I just stared at him like, wait, you, you know how to code? And he turns around and he looks like, I'm dead serious, Lucas, don't tell anyone. And I'm like, what, what do you mean don't tell anyone? He's like, the moment that this client realizes that I can code, I will also be asked to code. And that will make us as a team less efficient because then we will have no one to do the stakeholder management. We'll just be two code monkeys actually executing the tasks that we are given. And so it is very important, Lucas, that these people don't know <laughs> that I fixed your bug. And so I got the credit for fixing the bug in production. And, and it made me realize that the things that you learn, that the, they create opportunities, but they can also close opportunities, at, at least when you tell people about what you know, right? And so thinking about what you learn, not in the sense of like, what are you learning or what new skills are you picking up, but what opportunities are you trying to create for yourself, I think has been, has been helpful uh, for me. So what am I learning that, that we should know about? I, I'm, I'm actually uh, learning how to do finance. Uh, and the, the reason for that is that at some point I want to run my own business. And if I want to run my own business, I should be able to know how to do taxes and stuff like that. So that's what I'm, that's what I'm tinkering with. Yep. That's pretty important, right? Yep. Okay. Last one. Number four, top three resources, non-experimentation related that you'd that... recommend to listeners. <laughs> I don't like that constraint. <laughs> uh, top three resources. Constraints um, are one of the best ways to ideate, right? Yeah, fair, fair. Um, actually, uh, I, I cheated a little bit. I opened up my Goodreads and I started looking at sort of what, what are the books that I've read that have a, had a big impact on on me. Um, well, I've already mentioned Switch. I think that was good. I think uh, Predictably Irrational for me was one of the first books in the, in sort of the behavioral economics that changed my view on how humans operate. Um, by now, everyone's heard of thinking fast and slow, which came came later. But predictably, rational was actually built on on a lot of the same uh, work. Uh, if you've read Thinking Fast and Slow, you should actually also read the Undoing Project, which is the biography of the Kahneman and Tversky. It's an amazing book. Um, I'm, I, I'm, I lost count. Uh, and then the Radical Kadner and the Culture Code. I think in terms of sort of organizational dynamics and what it's like to be a boss and uh, and how teams operate. Uh, five dysfunctions of a team is also good, by the way. Uh, so the, um, I, I, I mean, top three issues is it really depends on what you want. Like it really depends on what you want to do. Like if you, if you want to be like a, a manager or you want to be a people manager, then you read different books than if you want to be a runner, right? If you want to get better at running, I highly recommend uh, Endurance and 80-20. Those are, those are books that changed how I view running. But I wouldn't go out here and say like, hey, I recommend everyone to read those books because I don't know whether you want to run, right? <laughs> so this idea of like top three recommendations, I don't know. Send me an email. Tell me what you want to learn. I will, uh, I will reply with a bunch of books to read. Good open invitation there to the audience. Lucas, let's, uh, let's leave it there. Fantastic chat. And thank you so much for joining us today on the podcast. Thanks for having me, Gavin. That was a blast. 
That's all from this episode of Experimentation Masters. Just one more thing before we say goodbye. We can use your help to keep improving the show. If you have any feedback or suggestions for future episodes, you can email at gavin at firstprinciples.ventures. Visit firstprinciples.ventures for show notes, resources, and information. If you enjoyed this show, give us a share on social media. Make sure that you subscribe so that you don't miss an episode. Experimentation Masters. Lead with more confidence.